beyond just the competitive nature, right? It allows for interesting, it allows for in-depth clash over the issues. Um, and I think this means that a lot of times people are trying to be too safe in the way that they approach opening government because they're scared of losing. Uh, and by the end of this uh, lecture, hopefully that's not the attitude you guys take. Hopefully you guys take a, a different mindset to it than we'll talk about. I also think that something that you sh we should understand is that judges will appreciate opening government teams that provide for interesting debate, not for safe debate, not for boring debate. So don't be afraid to take the hard line. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about based on that is the mindset of debate. Um, just to clarify, this says be offensive. It doesn't mean like Shaco yesterday. Um, it means like a forward on a football team offensive, like attacking, not necessarily making fun of people or uh, trying to insult people or be politically incorrect. Uh, and I have to clarify that because sometimes I do that. Um, so be offensive in the terms that you're taking the attack to the debate. Uh, you're not playing. Uh, you're not playing defense as a debate. We'll explain exactly what that means. Also take the hard line. Uh, again, meaning by that, when you have a choice, um, and I think the example we had yesterday of the ban smoking is a, is a good example. When you have a choice between what you want to do, whether it's say ban it in just public places or ban it holistically, we want to choose the hard line approach, which is ban it holistically. And this 100% of the time makes for a better debate that really focuses on what you're supposed to be talking about uh, rather than semantical or pragmatic argumentation that is really boring and doesn't get the root of the matter. Um, it, the, the problem with opening government, I think, is that it's easy to feel like you're the first team to speak, so everything you're saying is going to be attacked, and everything you're saying is going to be torn down. And I think that's where people get really defensive in their mindset. It's important to be offensive in the mindset as opening government. Otherwise, what we have is we have debates where people get up, they'll present their model, and then they'll tell us five things that their model won't do. They'll tell us five things that they don't want to accomplish because they're trying to preempt arguments because they're taking a defensive strategy. In an opening government, you don't want to be talking about what your model is not going to do. You don't want to be talking about what the debate is not about. You want to be talking about what your debate will actually accomplish, what your plan will actually do. Um, and don't be afraid to make propositions like that. I've got a couple of different strategies here for when I say be offensive, when I say take the hard line, ways of doing that. Um, and then try not to be uh, distracted by how amazing my PowerPoint and the slides and the colors are. Um, what, and then on the, on the right hand side, I have the benefits of each of these strategies. The first strategy is attack the status quo. A lot of people, like I said, they feel like opening government, you're putting something up to be attacked. This is the wrong mentality to take. You want to be thinking that the status quo is the opening government, and you're attacking the status quo. It, it's a lot easier way for people, and people feel a lot better when they're making fun of something, when they're rebutting like they're the one being attacked. So the status quo in a debate is the one that you want to attack. Um, if we take an example like this, like if you look at, say the motion was, this house would adopt the three state solution in Iraq. This house would split Iraq into three different countries. You don't want to just go up there and you don't want to say, if we split Iraq into three countries, it's going to be peaceful, there's going to be you know, stability, everybody's going to get along, and then let the opening opposition get up and attack you on that. The better approach to take is to look at the status quo, look at the problems that exist in that side of Iraq right now. Say there's massive, massive amounts of violence. The reason for this violence is because these groups of people are being forced to live together when they have nothing in common with each other, when they don't want to be living together, and it's artificially they're being put in the same area. We want to fix that on the opening government. We want to separate them. We want to rectify the issues that exist inside the status quo. You're essentially saying the same thing. But when you modify it to take an offensive approach to it rather than a defensive approach to it, A, it makes you feel more comfortable as a debater because you don't feel like you're proposing something that's going to be torn down, you feel like you're attacking something, and B, it's a lot more persuasive to the judges. The second thing is be controversial. And again, we can go back to the example that we had yesterday when we talked about the uh, banning smoking. What a lot of the teams did when they said they were going to ban smoking in just public places, they took the safer way out of it. If you want to take the controversial route, you want to take the route that is, is hardline, in other words, for yesterday's debate, we're going to ban smoking everywhere. This does a couple things. One, the biggest challenge of the opening government is after an hour of speakers, the judge has to remember what you said. If you make safe arguments, you run a safe line, you run a safe case, you have a safe model, the judge is way more likely to forget everything that you said. If you run a controversial, hardline case, the judge will remember everything that you said. If you were the prime minister that got up and said, we are going to ban smoking in the entirety of China, we don't care if you're in your own home, we don't care if you're in your car, we don't care if you're on the toilet, 
you, you are not allowed to smoke. The judge will remember what you said, and as the opening government team, that's one of the best ways to ensure that they keep you in mind for giving you the first at the end of the debate. The next thing that we want to talk about is, or I want to talk about, is you're going to prove the harder case. It's a similar topic, uh, it's a similar idea, and the other benefit of this is it cuts out your closing teams. Again, as an opening team, the last thing that you want is to set up a debate and then let your closing teams improve on everything that you said. If you set up a safe, small debate, then the opening teams can take it, they can expand it, they can look at bigger philosophical issues, they can be more controversial, and they basically, essentially, they one-up you. And the judges are going to give them credit for taking the debate to a new level. If you start off hardline, if you start off by examining the debate on a large scale, the closing teams can no longer do that. This is the best way to cut out closing teams and ensure that you are the one that starts the debate, you get credit for that, they don't take a first and a second over you because they talked about more important, more interesting things. Last of all, is this, the, what I've got on the benefits is a higher level of debating. It's easy to prove, um, it's easy to prove for yesterday, it's easier to prove that you could ban smoking in public places only. Or if we take an example of if we take an example of allow suicide, let's say this house would allow suicide. Some people would define this as, this house would allow suicide for individuals that are terminally ill. This is a safer way of doing it, rather than allow suicide for people across the board. If you can prove that anybody should be able to commit suicide, then by definition you are also proving that individuals that are terminally ill should be able to commit suicide. If you take the harder line, you're taking a, a more difficult argument, and the judges should appreciate that. It takes a better debater to prove to a judge that anybody that wants to commit suicide should be able to than a debater who says that only terminally ill patients, right? So it's not that the terminally ill patient is a bad argument. The fact of the matter is, though, if you argue the other, if you argue that everybody should be able to do it, the terminally ill is not only included inside of that, but also you get credit from a judge because they recognize that you chose a more difficult task, and if you're able to accomplish it, it proves that you're a better debater. I made this all on my own. <laughs> so this is the most uh, this is the most important aspect of the opening government here. And it's the setting up of the debate, um, and this is probably where the most um, confusion came in yesterday. So I want to be really specific, and this is where most of the time of, of my presentation is going to be spent on. The first the first thing we have is the interpretation of the motion, um, and this is where you choose everything that I was just talking about with the mindset is going to be continued throughout the entire. Uh, throughout my entire presentation. But it's really important when you're choosing how to interpret the motion. The difference between last year and uh, the different formats of the debate compared to British parliamentary is when you interpret the motion, we're not talking about word-for-word -word interpretations per se. We're not talking about defining each word inside of the motion. We're talking about really clarifying and conceptualizing what it is that the debate is going to be about. And the first thing to remember is you're trying to attempt you're attempting to produce the best debate possible. This means the best debate possible for everybody in the room. It does not mean the best debate possible for you as an opening government. Because a lot of times the best debate possible for you as an open government is the one where nobody else gets to talk because you set the debate in such a small area. Right? This actually is going, you think it's strategically smart, you feel safer because it's defensive once again, but the judge is going to punish you because you don't allow the rest of the debate to happen. Your job is to set up the debate for everybody to talk about. So keep that in mind when you're choosing how to interpret the motion. A couple of things that we want to talk about under the interpretation is A, the breadth of the interpretation. What I mean by that is how large or how small do we want to talk about this issue. If we have an example, say, international intervention in domestic disputes is a good thing. So the topic is, should international actors in, uh, partake and, and try and help, I suppose, in, in domestic disputes. You could talk about this in general, across the world, which is important. You could also set this somewhere, say for example, Honduras. Just had a, a coup, just had their government thrown out. Now, how do you make this choice? How do you decide how wide or how narrow to set it? Again, go back to the first line. Attempt to produce the best debate possible. If you want to narrow it down, two things. One, you're not narrowing it down to give yourself a huge advantage. You're narrowing it down to make the debate a little easier to conceptualize. Sometimes it's hard with huge topics and huge motions that could apply anywhere around the world to have a clear debate. Sometimes it's good to focus the debate in on a specific issue to make sure that everybody knows what they're talking about. That's a fair way to narrow down the debate. That's a fair reason to limit the breadth of the definition, is to make sure that everybody knows what they're talking about. 
Now, if you do this, there can be examples brought in from any other part of the world. You are not allowed to say we are just talking about Honduras. Nobody can talk about anything else. The purpose of narrowing it down is to just ensure that everybody has a, a frame of reference that they can make sure the debate is clear on so nobody gets confused because the debate is not too large to handle. The next thing we have is changing the status quo. And I think one of the things that's important to recognize is that status quo in any country, and American debaters are horrible at this, the status quo in any country is different. If you're in a tournament like this one, where most of the, everybody is from China, you can talk about the status quo in China. If you plan on going to international tournaments, however, the status quo is going to be different no matter where you go. So when you're interpreting the motion and you're trying to change the status quo, realize that the status quo in some places is going to be much different, in fact, maybe opposite than the status quo where you're coming from. So it's important that you try and do something different when you interpret the motion, but at the same time, you have to recognize that what that is and how that compares to the status quo that you're used to, how it compares to the, the state of affairs in your country might be different than the state of affairs in other countries. The next thing we have under the interpret the motion, and this is, this is a horrible thing, is a definitional challenge. You, you never, ever, ever want this to happen. Um, but I think in opening government, it's important to understand what a definitional challenge is to make sure that you never allow it to happen. We've talked about this a little bit. Basically, when you have defined, when you have interpreted the motion in an unfair manner, the opening opposition can challenge your interpretation of it. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday. So I want to go into, there's three different ways, there's three different types of challenges. And it's basically illegal for you to interpret the motion in this way. Um, Jess is going to go over in the opening opposition speech what the opposition side does if the opening government produces any of these definitions, but I want to talk about it on the opening government so you don't produce that, so it's never needed, ever. It's a horrible thing. The first one is it's called a squirrel, like a little rodent. Um, and basically the definition from the rules of debate is that, that the uh, interpretation must have a clear and logical link to the motion. The interpretation has to follow the spirit of the motion. If it doesn't, it's called a squirrel, it's illegal, it's unfair, you just messed up the entire debate, I hope you get forth. Uh, example of this, there was a motion at Worlds a few years ago that celebrity criminals should receive harsher punishments than your average citizens. And the team in the debate defined this as Saddam Hussein should get the death penalty. That's a squirrel. That's horrible. Um, obviously, it's not along the spirit of the motion. If you wanted to get really, really technical, Yes, Saddam Hussein is a, is a celebrity. Yes, the death penalty is a harsher punishment. That's obviously not what the motion is asking for, though. So that would be a squirrel. The opening opposition is in their, within their right to challenge the definition. Don't do anything like that. The second type of uh, definitional challenge is called a truism. That means that if your interpretation of the motion should not be self-proving. Basically, it shouldn't be that something should or should not that's just obvious. You shouldn't come up and propose that we shouldn't kill innocent people. The opposition has no rebuttal to that. It's not a fair definition. It makes the opening government feel like they're clever. They say, ha, we came up with something that you can't answer. That's not a good thing. That's a problem. The point of a debate is that there should be an answer to it, and we should have clash on the arguments. Similarly, you shouldn't be able to argue something is or something is not. The example of this is life after genocide is better. If that's your interpretation of the motion, you've just set up a horrible debate that's completely unfair for the opposition side. You're trying to prove that people not dying is awesome. Good job. You're not a very good debater if you can prove that. The third thing is a time place set. This is the third type of definitional challenge. Um, and again, a time place set is when you unfairly set a, a specific time or a specific place on the motion. For example, if we had the three-state solution in Iraq as our motion, if you were to say, in the year 2050, half a century from now, when everybody in Iraq loves each other, we're going to separate it into three different countries. That's not fair either. Right? Or if you were to set it 300 years ago in Iraq, where there were no cars or no guns or no anything to kill each other with, then we would separate into three different solutions. This is called a time set. You're not allowed to do that. Similarly, for a place set, do not set it so specific that nobody else knows about it. Again, reference back to what I was talking about with the interpretation of the motion in Honduras. This is a fair play set because everybody, it's in the news, it helps clarify the debate, and you have a reasonable assumption that everybody knows what you're talking about. When we were in Thailand Worlds, there was a motion that had to deal with the, how to care for homeless individuals, 
and a team from Thailand set it on the corner of a street in Bangkok. They said the government should move homeless people from this specific bus station. Nobody else in the debate had any clue what they were talking about. It didn't really matter. It was totally unfair. That should be challenged. Okay, the next thing, so those are definitional challenges. And again, Jess is going to get on to if your opposition and somebody does one of those things besides slapping them, how should you should deal with it? The next thing is point of controversy and team line. These two things are intertwined. The point of controversy is identifying where the clash in the debate lies. This is important to do as an open government team. It's also strategically advantageous since your whole purpose is to be the team that everybody in the debate references. It's important to set up not just your side of the debate, but also it can be important to set up the opposing side of the debate for them and hopefully they follow along with it. First of all, the major, the major flaw in debates a lot of times is a lack of engagement. And I know that pretty much all of the presenters so far have talked about this. In other words, when the government team is arguing for one thing, the opposition team is arguing for another thing, and those two things never actually meet. They're completely independent of each other. No debate actually happens. One side is saying, this is amazing. The other side says, this is amazing. They're both right. The judges have no way of weighing those two things against each other. Identifying the point of controversy essentially means that you are identifying where the clash in the debate is supposed to exist. What exactly, where exactly are we as a government and an opposition side supposed to meet? Where exactly are we supposed to be arguing on? An example for like say, say that if the motion were this house would legalize narcotics. One side could be talking about, we're going to legalize, legalizing narcotics eliminates the black market. So if a government side says we're going to legalize narcotics, they could argue that this is going to eliminate a black market, it's going to make it all uh, legitimate. The other side could be arguing that the government shouldn't be providing a moral stance that says narcotics is okay. These are both good arguments, but in no way do they address each other. In no way is there clash. The idea of a black market does not deal with the idea of a government should not taking a moral stance on an issue. So there's no point of controversy, there's no engagement in that debate. Both, both sides are making arguments that are separate from one another. Instead of this, the point of controversy in this debate should be whether or not individuals have personal autonomy to make their own choices, or whether a government needs to be, take a paternalistic stance and ensure that people are protected against themselves. This is almost the same debate that we have with the ban smoking. Should the government, should people be able to smoke? Should people be able to make choices that might harm themselves? Or should the government be able to step in and tell them what to do or what not to do? These two ideas are in direct opposition to each other. These two ideas directly clash with each other. That produces for a good debate, as opposed to a debate that might have happened yesterday that says people's health is important over here, and then people's, the economy is important over here. You, there isn't a clash on those two arguments. Both of those two things are good. Somebody needs to take a stance and show exactly why one not is good, but is better than the other one. That's where the point of controversy lies. One important thing to note, when you're the opening government and you're deciding for the whole debate what the point of controversy is, you want to be fair. You want the opening opposition side to agree with what you have identified as the point of controversy. The goal is to debate, get to the debate to happen as you laid it out. Your main job is setting up the debate. So you want the opening opposition side to go along with what you have identified as the point of controversy. If you miscategorize the other side, they're going to reject it, they're going to ignore you, you're going to be forgotten. Example, if the government, if in, our, in our example of the narcotics, uh, the narcotics motion, if the government, as the opposition side, you have laid out that the government has to know all people's individual situations better than people know themselves, that's not a fair burden to put on the opposition side. The opposition side will not agree with that. The opposition side will not go with that. You will not have identified the point of controversy. Therefore, you will not have de uh, defined the debate. You will not have interpreted the debate correctly. You will not have set up the debate correctly, and you'll get punished for that. The next thing is team line. Finding an underlying theme to your case. That's what that says. Finding an underlying theme to your case. This goes along with the point of controversy. Generally, your team line is going to be your half of the point of controversy. What you're attempting to do is you're attempting to give one line of attack for your team that makes it easy for the judge to identify what you're standing for. As opposed to having five or six different arguments that are completely unrelated, if you have a team line that unifies all of those arguments, it makes it really easy, again, for a judge to look back at the end of the debate and remember exactly what it was your team stood for. 
So in the same example, if we talk about if we talk about the narcotics, a team line could be absolute personal autonomy for all individuals because they know their situation better. Every argument you make links back to that idea. And again, if you remember, that was your half of the point of controversy if you're the government side in that debate. The next thing we have is a problem and a goal. And I wrote self-explanatory, and I wrote a question mark, because a lot of times people forget about this. People get so caught up in making arguments that they forget to really look at why it is that the motion is proposed, what is the problem in the status quo, and earlier we talked about making sure that you're attacking the status quo. If you don't do this, if you don't identify a problem in the status quo, you can't attack the status quo. People come up with individual arguments without actually identifying why it is the debate has been given to them and what their goal is in the debate. It's important to do this. For example, if you look at the motion this house would legalize suicide, the personal right to control life is a point. Safeguarding against abuse is a point. Places that implement this effectively, examples of places that have suicide legal, is an argument. None of those arguments have actually identified what the problem is. None of those arguments have actually identified anything that you're trying to fix. So at the end of a debate, at the end of a prep time, and you come into the round and you have those arguments, yes, you've said something, yes, you've made arguments for your side, but you never actually identified what it is about the status quo, what it is about the world that's so horrible that you want to fix it, that you want to propose something new. Instead, you need to talk about exactly why people would want to commit suicide. What's going on in their lives, what's a problem with society, and how exactly is what you've proposed going to find and going to be a solution for those things. So make sure that you never forget to identify what the problem is in the status quo and what your goal is at the end of the debate. A long line, along the uh, same lines as having a team line, Again, it's a unified approach, it's a unified direction that you're taking as a team to ensure that you, uh, the judge knows and that you know exactly what it is that you're trying to accomplish. All right, this, this is the big one, this is the confusing one, um, the model or the solution. The first thing you have to ask yourself is depending on what the motion is, depending on what the motion is, is a model necessary? Some topics, some debate motions are not going to require a model. For example, if you had a value-based motion, say this house protects, this house values environmental protection over economic sustainability, you don't necessarily need a model for that debate. You could argue that debate purely on principles, purely philosophically. That doesn't mean you can't have a model for that debate. On the alternative to that though, if the motion was reform the United Nations Security Council, it clearly calls for you to do something. You're asked to reform something, you need to propose the way in which you are going to reform it. Under motions like the environmental protection motion, a lot of times you can put in a model, once again, just as when you set the debate, just as when you interpret the debate, you can put in a model in order to clarify and conceptualize the debate for people. It makes it, the debate easier to grasp, and that way everybody knows what they're talking about, it makes the debate a lot clearer. The problem is though, don't focus the debate around specifically that model. Don't focus the debate around only that idea. Focus the debate, that's a way to make sure that everybody's clear on what you're talking about, but you want to include the overarching arguments that deal with the general philosophical underpinnings of the motion. For example, if you wanted to talk about environmental protection, you could argue that people should implement a green tax. This is an example of valuing environmental protection over uh, economic sustainability or uh, economic development, but the debate should not be about just that one specific model. You're simply using it as a way to clarify to make sure that everybody's on the same page so nobody's confused about what they're talking about. One thing to realize too is different judges have different approaches to this. There are judges that think that you should have a model for everything. So sometimes it's beneficial to put up a model even in the simplest form, just to make sure the judges are happy if they're horrible and they think that you need a model for everything. It's good to safeguard yourself against that sort of thing and it, it never uh, hurts to provide a little bit of extra clarity to the debate. When you're coming up with a model, what's the goal of the model? I've got it written down here, you're trying to shut off attacks on efficacy and logistics, you're not trying to shut off attacks on principles. So if we go back to our legalized uh, suicide model, let's say we're legalizing assisted suicide, doctor assisted suicide. You don't have to provide a model that says you walk in, you go up to the doctor, you say kill me, and he does it. Right? I guess it's a model, but it's not a very good one. 
you can propose a model like what a lot of countries have adopted where you go in, you make a statement that you want to uh, end your life, and then six months later, you come back in and you say that I still stand by my statement, and then they go ahead and they perform the suicide. The difference between these two models is you've shut off attacks on efficacy and you've shut off attacks on logistics. You've told people, like there's obvious, obvious flaws with the first one in terms of how that model is implemented. The second one is implemented more effectively. However, what you're not doing is you're not shutting off any principled attacks. People are still able to argue everything that they would be able to argue with the first one in the second one. The next thing we want to talk about is how the model brings about the desired goal. Again, go back to the last slide we had. Well, I, I've got the slide. The last slide we had was identify the problem and identify a goal. It's important that your model, you show how your model actually achieves that goal. If you have a goal that you've identified and your model does nothing to bring the world closer to that to where you want it, then your model probably isn't very good. So tell the judges exactly why it is that you've chosen this model and exactly what it is that this model is going to do to make sure that that goal comes into fruition. One, of the, one good way of doing this is to show uh, precedence of where the model has worked before. If you implement, for example, our assisted suicide, there's a lot of countries in Scandinavia that have models along the same lines. There's a lot of governments that have implemented this, and it works fairly well for them. This is a good way to show that your model is going to accomplish what you say it's going to accomplish. This isn't a golden ticket, though, that says, look, we've shown you where it happens before. That means we automatically win. You still have to prove that where your examples of it happened before, why they apply to where you're putting it into place. So, if, for example, if you're going to implement that in China, why is it that the same effect would happen in China as happens in, say, Sweden, uh, and why it is that that model, uh, why, explain why the model works in the country that you look to. Don't just say, it works in Sweden, we swear, we're not sure why, uh, but it does, so we think we should do it here. So explain how it works in the country that it's already implemented in, and explain more importantly how that's going to also work in the region in which you want to implement it. The last thing I've got is your model should be forgotten about. So after you've done all that work, and you've come up with this amazing model, your goal in a debate should be for nobody to talk about it ever again. The reason for that is the model is not where the debate lies. The principles and the philosophies and the arguments is where the debate should lie. If your model is continuously talked about, it, it probably means there's a massive hole in it. There's something totally, terribly wrong with it. If you produce a good model that has no holes, it accomplishes what you say it's going to accomplish, nobody attacks you on that, then you can argue about whether or not the model is a good idea or a bad idea rather than whether it will work or whether it will not work. The example yesterday we had again with banned smoking. Uh, there was obviously some efficacy issues uh, in terms of what the government side proposed. So if you want to ban smoking everywhere, the opposition side in my debate asked me, well, it's impossible. You can't ban smoking everywhere. So does that mean it's a bad model? And I think the answer also that we had in the demonstration debate by uh, Jing Bo, where he said, or no, it wasn't him. Anyway, somebody made an answer, it was amazing. Um, on the idea of murder, if a government eliminates, if a government stops or has, has murder illegal, does it mean that they can necessarily stop every murder? Every murder? The answer obviously is no, but it doesn't mean that the government shouldn't try to stop every murder. So in the ban smoking, if the government could ban smoking, it doesn't have to be able to ban it entirely. The debate should be about if the government could ban one person from smoking, if the government could stop one person from smoking, would that be a good thing? And the government side is supposed to say, obviously, yes, if we could get one person to not smoke, this will be a better world than if that one person were smoking. And the opposition side is supposed to say, if that one person, you stop them from smoking, it is a horrible thing, you are a terrible, oppressive, awful government, and we don't think we should accept that. We shouldn't be debating about, well, we think you're going to get 20 people to stop, and we think you're going to get 100 people to stop. That's not where the debate lies. So the model, once you've laid it out, if you did a good job, it should be forgotten about, and you should allow the rest of the debate to happen where the important argumentation lies. All right, motion-specific burdens. Every time you get a motion, every motion is going to bring with it different burdens that it lays upon you. It's going to present unique challenges to you, uh, it, whether, it's a, whether it's a new topic or whether it's an old topic with a twist on it. It's going to ask for you to do something uh, specific, and a good motion is going to call for you 
a good motion is going to call for you to explain the uniqueness of certain scenarios. For example, yesterday's motion in the demonstration debate, and this came up a lot of times in the debate, is exactly why the internet is so important. What's unique about the internet? The government side in yesterday's debate had a motion-specific burden to identify what makes the internet different than other forms of media. Motion-specific burdens, they can come in a couple of different ways. A, they could be clarification. B, they could be major weaknesses that exist. Or C, they could be talking about different words that come up in the motion that might be important. For example, anytime there's a motion that says you have to do something completely, ban all of anything, or allow none of anything, any absolute terms like that, it's important to identify as an opening government team, why is it that we're doing it across the board? Why is it that no one is allowed to do it? Or why is it that everybody has to do it? And we're not going to allow for it to happen on a case-by-case -case basis. Or if the motion is saying on a case-by-case -case basis, again, like the internet round, what makes the internet unique? What makes this thing different? So as an opening government, you should identify what these burdens are and come up with answers to them. If we have the three-state solution in Iraq, a couple obvious burdens for this. If you're going to divide a country into three pieces, who's going to do it? It's an obvious motion-specific burden. Or how will it be reinforced? How will it be enforced? How will the separation be enforced? This is another burden that you should identify as an open government as a question that you're going to have to answer. An easy way to remember, or an easy way to conceptualize what these burdens could be, is think about the types of points of information that you would be asked by your opposition side. If you got up and you proposed that you're going to cut Iraq into three pieces, and you never said how, and you never said who, the first thing your opposition side asks in a point of information is probably, who is going to be doing this? Because it totally changes the debate depending on what actor you choose. So when you get the motion, think of those types of clarifications that are necessary. Think of those types of burdens. Now, once you've identified them, what do you do about it? A lot of teams run away from it. And again, this gets back to the offensive mindset that we talk about. You do not want to run away from the burdens. You want to come up with answers for the burdens. They are your side. The motion calls for you to defend them. You need to think of a way to defend them, not think of a way to get out of them. The first thing you can do is you can come up with a solution or a model. And this is the pragmatic, in terms of pragmatic burdens that we were just talking about, this is what your model could be good for. If you look at what type of actor you could choose, let's say uh, in, the, in the Iraqi example, you could choose the United States, you could choose the United Nations, uh, you could choose the Free Trade Association of the Americas, if you wanted to, it'd probably be bad. Um, but what you want to realize is that no matter, with each actor that you choose, you're taking on different advantages and you're taking on different weaknesses. For example, if you said the United States is going to do it, you're going to have to deal with people saying that the United States is a hegemonic power. You're going to have to deal with people saying that the United States does what it wants unilaterally. It's hard to check. If the United Nations is your actor, you're going to have to deal with people saying that there's bureaucracy, nothing ever gets accomplished inside of the United Nations, they, don't actually, they aren't actually going to be effective in implementing it. Is there a right or wrong thing to choose? No. You can choose either one you want. The important thing is you identify what burdens that these choices place on you, and you develop a way to answer it as an opening government team. The other thing you can do, and this is important, the other thing you can do when you get a, a, a burdens like this is you can concede arguments. You can concede that the opposition side is going to win that argument. For example, you can concede that rights in some of these other debates, like smoking, Rights come with responsibilities. If you're on, a, if you're on the, uh, a team that says you're going to allow people to smoke everywhere, you can concede that people are going to get sick. You can concede that there are going to be health risks. Don't run away from that. But at the same time, after you've conceded that, you put up a more important principle. You say, even though we know there are health risks, the people who are smoking also know there are health risks. They have the right to choose that for themselves. They have the right to make that decision on how they're going to live their life. So you don't run away from the burden of people dying. People dying is okay if people choose that they are doing that under their own accord. If people choose that decision consciously and they say we are willing to accept the fact that we are going to have health detriments. So again, identify the burden, figure out a way to respond to it, don't figure out a way to run away from it. Awesome. Arguments for dummies. The judges are the dummies by the way. Where's Steve? Like we saw in yesterday's debate. Um, okay, why did I put arguments after the setting up of the debate? There's a few reasons for this. The first is, as an opening government team, it's important to clarify, it's important to have everybody on the same page, you know what you're talking about. 
The second reason for this is a lot of the things we just talked about are arguments in and of themselves. When you identify a problem, you're also giving an argument at the same time. When you identify a goal, you're giving an argument at the same time. When you're outlining the point of controversy, similarly, you're giving an argument. So by the end of the setup of the debate, you should actually already have at least three or four arguments that provide for clarification of the debate at the same time. So I think that's important to, uh, to recognize. The other thing is that it's important to not come up with arguments before you've conceptualized what the debate is about. Until you've set up the debate and you've decided where you're talking about, what's going to be happening, where the controversy lies, you don't want to come up with arguments. Otherwise, those arguments will be irrelevant. If you come up with an argument before you decide to talk about Honduras, and then you don't realize that that argument doesn't apply anymore, you're going to be making mistakes. And this is, again, what happened in the debate yesterday, where individuals made choices to run arguments that weren't directly related to the way that the debate was set up. They chose to run arguments without having a firm idea, and it was me, by the way, without having a firm idea of how the debate was supposed to be conceptualized. And so, again, like in yesterday's debate, even if those are good arguments, they're not as applicable as other arguments that are made directly to the setup of the debate. One of the most important things, and I don't want to get into too much of what an argument is, I know Steve covered this a bit in the adjudication briefing, but I think it's important for all the teams to understand how to make a basic argument. Uh, you want to have complete arguments. You want to be, a complete argument is a clear argument. And there's a lot of words and there's a lot of theories for what a complete argument is. This is my own interpretation that I think is simple and straightforward and, and serves the purpose. Oh, that sucks. There we go. Um, that serves the purpose of an opening government team. Uh, basically, you have three parts to it. You have the original, you have the actual, the initial statement or argument. You have the logic, and then you have the conclusion. What does that mean? That means that you're saying something. You're saying it's going to do something and then you're saying how it's going to do that. Uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Now, one thing that you need to understand is that a lot of times there's multiple logical steps to get from your initial statement to your conclusion. Make sure that you make each one of those. One of the biggest mistakes that debaters make is assuming that their judge can figure out exactly how what they're saying works. If they say, this is our original statement, it's going to do this, they just expect that the judge can fill in the middle ground for them. This doesn't happen. Even in, the, even in the simplest arguments that only have one logical link between them, you shouldn't make the judge do that. And you shouldn't leave it up to the judge. You shouldn't risk... Really? That's okay. It still says the same thing. You shouldn't risk the judge having to make that sort of delineation for you. You should make sure that you put the judge through to where the judge... There's absolutely no chance that they can make a mistake in understanding your argument. And again, this is the mistake that was made yesterday by the horrible closing government team uh, when they made argumentation, and instead of explicitly explaining how that argumentation worked, uh, they left it up for the judge to interpret exactly how they thought the argument worked. If that had been made clearer, the closing gov would have gotten first. <laughs> so... Recognize that there's multiple steps, and recognize, though, if you do choose an argument that has multiple logical steps, there is a lot of room for confusion. Sometimes, even if you have what you think is an amazing argument, if it's too long, if, it's, if there's too many steps, you might not want to use it in a debate, because it has the potential for confusion. It has the potential for the, uh, for the judge to not exactly understand what you're trying to say. This is particularly dangerous as the opening government team. As the opening government, after your two speeches, you are out of the debate. And one of the most frustrating things as an opening government speaker is to hear everybody on the opposition side try to tell you what you said and get it totally wrong. And while you're sitting in your seat or trying to stand up for points of information to clarify and they're telling you to sit down, you get angrier and angrier and it's not good for your health and it's not good for the debate. So make sure that when you're deciding what arguments to run, you choose arguments that are straight to the point, you choose arguments that are clear. The other thing to remember is that... Oh, there we go. The other thing to remember is that the judge was not sitting in on your prep time. A lot of times when you're preparing with your partner and you're coming up with arguments, they make sense to you. The judge didn't sit through your line of thinking in the 30 minutes of prep time though. The judge wasn't sitting with you. So they're hearing, they're hearing all of this for the first time. Sorry, it's not my fault, I swear. They're sitting with you, they're hearing the argument for the first time, which means that even though it makes complete sense to you, as you were the one that came up with it, it might not make sense to the judge. 
Uh, this is a good chance to use your partner during prep time, so your partner could be telling you if the argument that you're coming up with makes sense to them, or vice versa. So ensure that you're, you're remembering the fact that you're biased. You want the argument to make sense, you've heard the argument before, you came up with the argument, the judge is supposed to be objective, and the judge is hearing it for the first time. So really err on the side of clarity, really err on the side of making, ensuring that the judge is not, um, the judge is not uh, confused by what you're saying. And again, that gets back to the title where we talk about the judges are dumb. You want to assume the judge is dumb. It's the safest way to go about it. We hope the judges are smart, but if you assume that the judge is dumb, you talk to them like they're dumb, you make sure that it's blatantly clear what you're saying, there can be no mistakes. You don't leave the debate in the hands of the judge, you want to tell the judge very clearly what to do. That's the best way to ensure that you're going to win. And the slide totally changed, but you guys can't see it, because it's all blue. Can we... Thanks, Steve. This next slide says the arguments, depth of argumentation versus burning turf. All right, so depth of argumentation versus burning turf. What this means is when you're choosing, and we had some questions on this yesterday also, when you're choosing your strategy and how to come up with arguments, you have to choose whether you're going to come up with one argument and you're going to flush it out completely, or if you're going to come up with two or three arguments, or if you're going to come up with a multitude of arguments. I like it though, let's see. Oh, you're so smart, Steve. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's sabotaging me on purpose. So, <laughs> how, do you, how do you make this decision? How do, you, how do you decide whether you're going to take one argument and fully develop it, or if you're going to take multiple arguments? A lot of teams, specifically American teams, and I hope you never see them, and if you do see them, I hope you never copy them, try and bring up as many arguments as possible in an attempt to overwhelm the opposition teams. The problem with that is oftentimes when you bring up all of those arguments, you don't do what we just talked about, which is make sure that each of them is complete. Make sure that each of them makes sense, make sure that all of the logical steps are outlined, make sure that you've identified how that links back to your problem and how you, that links back to your goal. So you never want to sacrifice the depth of argumentation in an attempt to produce more arguments. That isn't to say that necessarily every debate you should only have one argument. Depending on the motion, you can decide whether you're going to run more or less arguments. I would argue if there's a, if there's a obvious mo motion like smoking that has one obvious benefit. So if we're going to ban smoking, the obvious benefit is the health benefits. There really isn't an argument in the debate that can outweigh the health benefit if you make it well. On a motion like that, it might be a better strategy to focus in on the health argument, talk about all of the examples you can think of, talk about all the people that are affected, you talk about the individual smoker, you talk about their children, you talk about secondhand smokers, you talk about individuals that work in smoking related jobs, and you flush out that argument as much as you can. Because no matter how many other arguments your closing team comes up with, they're not going to be able to outweigh that one argument. It's the clearest, strongest argument of the debate. So in that instance, you make sure that you've identified that and you go for the depth of argumentation versus the burning of the turf, which means tons of arguments. Another motion, though, might be uh, implement salary caps for CEOs of corporations. This is a kind of boring motion. Um, beyond that, there's not necessarily one argument that trumps every other argument in the debate. Realizing that, you might want to take on three or four arguments as opposed to just focusing on one argument. Since you probably, I don't think there's an argument you can identify as the most important per se, and your open closing team will be able to bring up multiple arguments. So in a motion like that, it might be better to lean towards making more arguments. Now, that being said, you never want to make so many arguments that you cannot complete all of them. If you make six or seven arguments, and this is what a lot of the questions were yesterday in terms of the closing teams, if your opening team has said everything that you wanted to say, what do you do about it? An opening team cannot possibly ever cover all of the arguments. If they try and say all of the arguments, they are going to leave some of them underdeveloped, and as a closing team, they can take that and they can develop, they can pick the strongest ones and run away with them. So as an opening team, you choose the amount of arguments that you can to ensure that all of them are complete. You never want to sacrifice the quality of the arguments for the quantity of the arguments. I'm going to push a button, and I hope... Oh, no, I'm not going to push a button yet. We're still safe. Okay, clear line of attack. This gets back to the team line and the point of controversy. If all of your arguments share a common direction, 
they're going to be stronger. If all of your arguments follow under the one team line, they're going to help support each other, since they're all interrelated. If you look at an example, like, hopefully a lot of people in here play basketball, um, the Lakers a couple of years ago had Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, Karl Malone, amazing players, five all-star players. They lost. They were horrible. Why were they horrible? Because even though all five of them were amazing individually, none of them worked together. None of them tied in together. This is similar to what can happen in debate. This is similar to what happened in the debate yesterday. Even though there were good arguments on the table, and a lot of the questions in the, in the Q&A after the demo debate were asking, these are very good arguments, why weren't they as strong as they, we thought they could have been? None of them had a unified line of attack. None of them were operating under the same premises. None of them were going in line with the same, uh, none of them were following the same team line. So individual strong arguments sometimes aren't as good as an argument that may seem to be weaker, but supports everything else that you're saying. To ensure that as a team, as a complete speech, you're presenting a stronger, uh, you're presenting a stronger line of attack. All right, button, here we go. Yes. The Deputy Prime Minister. We've got two halves of the Deputy Prime Minister, um, the left and the right. Um, we have the split and we have the rebuttal. This is also called the constructive and the deconstructive material, which some of the, people, some of the uh, presenters have labeled it. It could also be called positive and negative matter. Um, all of those names are correct. Essentially what it means is the split or the constructive or the positive matter is a new matter coming from the Deputy Prime Minister. Make sure that you have one. A lot of times the Deputy Prime Minister gets up and they repeat what their partner said, which is important, and they clarify what their partner said, which is important, and they rebut the opposition, which is important, and they say absolutely nothing on their own. If you're trying to cut out a closing team, if you're trying to produce and move the debate forward, the deputy position is one of the best places to do it in. The deputy position can ensure that you cover more ground, like we talked about in the depth of argumentation versus the burning of the turf. In two speeches, you can cover the ground. You can cover more ground and you can still do it in a manner that does it clearly uh, and logically. So you take advantage of that. Make sure you have a split. How are you coming up with a split? A split, as opposed to an extension, which we'll talk about later today, an extension coming out of the closing teams, is new material, but it's much more closely related to what your partner said. It's new material, but since you are on the same team as the Prime Minister, it's going to be a lot more linked, a lot more tightly linked to what the Prime Minister said, rather than what a closing team might say in an extension. The best way to come up with a split, the best way to think of this for a, Prime Minister, or for a Deputy Prime Minister, is to not come up with two speeches for the Prime Minister and the Deputy, but to come up with one 14-minute speech. If you think about the opening government as one speech rather than two, they ensure that both of you are on the same page, you're both linked, and your arguments are going to make coherent, logical, progressive, chronological, amazing sense. So how are you, once you have your one speech, your one 14-minute speech, how are you going to order it, how are you going to split it up? You want to prioritize, A, prioritize the importance of what you're saying. Prioritize the importance of your arguments. You don't want to leave the most important arguments for your Deputy Prime Minister. By the time the, these important arguments come up, the leader of opposition will have already completely destroyed your prime minister because he didn't say anything good, uh, and then it's too late for you as an opening team to come back from that. So make sure that a lot of the, the mandatory arguments, the strongest arguments, should be coming out in the prime minister's speech. This doesn't mean to give the deputy prime minister just the leftovers. They still should have something important to say so they don't feel horrible. Um, they could talk about different special interest groups, that what the opening of what the prime minister told you, different people that that affects. They could talk about different examples for the same principles that came out of the Prime Minister. They could talk about overarching philosophies that might tie in what the Prime Minister said, tie all that together. These are a couple different argue, types of arguments that the, the split could uh, partake in. The other thing you don't want is you don't want to have a, what's called a hung case. In other words, the Prime Minister says something and it doesn't make sense until after the Deputy Prime Minister has gotten up and talked. For example, if we were to legalize narcotics as the motion, and the Prime Minister were to say that there's, we don't believe there's any real choice when you're dealing with drugs. We don't believe that people have a, a real choice in a situation when they're taking narcotics. And it wasn't until the Deputy Speaker got up and talked about how drugs might make people addicted, or how drugs might affect people's minds, which would alter their decision-making processes, this would be called a hung case. 
Everything the Prime Minister said relies on the Deputy Prime Minister to come up and talk, which isn't fair to the Leader of Opposition, and it's not clear, and the judges won't be happy with you, and you probably won't do very well. The next thing I want to talk about is there's no such thing as your own arguments. When you're prepping, a lot of times between the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister and they're choosing who is going to say what, just because you thought of it doesn't mean necessarily it should go in your speech. If the Deputy Prime Minister thinks of an argument that's important, that's philosophical, that's pertinent to the model, it should go in the Prime Minister's speech. If the Prime Minister thinks of something that would make more sense in the Deputy Prime Minister's speech, give them that argument. The worst way to come up with and structure your speech is to just give people everything that they thought of. It, it, there's no coherent logical progression to it. It doesn't make sense chronologically, philosophically, in any sort of way. So make sure that you look at it as one speech and you structure the arguments not by who came up with them, but by where they make the most impact and where they benefit you strategically. The last thing is, if you're the Deputy Prime Minister and you have no idea what you're going to say, uh, which happens a lot because you just can't think of enough arguments, you can use rebuttal of the opening opposition as a split. The trick is, you can't call it rebuttal. This is totally cheating, but if you do it right, the judges won't know. Check this out. So, a lot of times it's hard to think of things, to, enough arguments to fill out both speeches. If the opposition side, as you're, as you're the deputy, the opposition side makes an argument, you can take the flip side to that argument, frame this positive material, and use that as your split. For example, if the motion, we go back to our suicide motion. If the opposition side says that it's the government's role to protect the right to life, so they're against suicide, and they tell you the government has to protect the right to life. As a deputy prime minister, you could hear that, and you could say that your split is going to be that we are going to include the right to end your life as part of the right to life. You lie, you say you came up with that in prep time, you say it's a complete coincidence that that was the opposition side's case, and that's your split. So you take it and you turn it into positive material. You have a positive, constructive argument that says that the right to life has to include the right to end your life. It's a good way to make sure that you have something to say positively in your speech. It's not really cheating, it's just clever. All right, the rebuttal. This is the other half, this is the deconstructive or the negative matter half of the uh, deputy's speech. The first thing we want to talk about is rebuilding. And this is going to be clarification of what your partner said. And again, based on some of the questions yesterday, you never, ever, ever want to admit that you made a mistake. You never want to admit that your partner made a mistake. You never want to say that the Prime Minister was wrong. You guys are on the same team. Uh, undercutting him might make you look better, but it definitely will give you guys the loss as a team. Uh, you, got, you can yell at him after the debate, or her, after the debate for doing a horrible job. But don't admit it while you're in the round. Never change what you guys said. Um, you have to clarify it and you have to do everything that you can to blame it on the opposition side for not understanding what was obviously a very clear speech by your partner because they're amazing and they would never make a mistake and clearly the judge will notice that and say that it was the opposition's fault. So make sure that you rebuild what your partner said and again clarity is key on the opening government because you're not going to get a talk again, you want to be remembered, you do not want there to be confusion otherwise you did not set up a very good debate. Let me see. I've got next is comparative analysis. Show comparative analysis. And we talked about this a little bit before when we talked about engagement. You, the debate doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Both opposing sides are going to have good values. You need to show why yours is better, not necessarily why theirs is uh, why yours is good only. You have to show why yours is better than theirs. So we, we talked about this earlier, so I'll skip over it really quick. But the example was the environmental sustainability before the economic development. Obviously, environmental sustainability is a good thing. Obviously, economic development is a good thing. As the Deputy Prime Minister, you're the first person of your team, you're the only person of your team that gets to rebut the concepts of the opposite side. You don't want to simply repeat that environmental sustainability is amazing. You want to show why this thing is better than they, what they talked about. Don't debate in a vacuum where your arguments exist independently of the opposing side. Make sure you engage the opposing side. For example, you could argue that economic development has to come before environmental sustainability. This is showing a direct comparison between these two principles. Or on the flip side of things, you could argue that environmental sustainability is more time sensitive 
than economic development if you're on the uh, other side of the debate. You could argue that we have to do this now because the economic development can wait. If we wait too long with environmental sustainability, uh, then we're all going to be